next I will be introducing uh, two P Prada trustees, actually. So first up, we have uh, Willie Old and Dr. Lisa Punt. Uh, Willie actually suffered from aggressive prostate cancer and is now helping to raise awareness for Prada. And Dr. Lisa Punt is the center head at Maggie's, as well as being a Prada trustee. They'll be talking about meeting the needs of people with psychosocial difficulties due to pelvic radiation disease. Take it away. Computer. So probably if I just introduce you first of all, and then we'll yep. go from there. Yep. So thank you so much really for coming and joining us today on this great opportunity to share the information about PRD. Um, we've had some amazing presentations today, but I think for me as a healthcare professional, one of the, the real important issues is to hear from people that themselves are touched by PRD and the impact it actually has on, well, everyday life. Um, I, at the moment, am working as a centre head within Maggie's and I'm still supporting people affected by PRD. But actually, it's been something that I've been really focused on for many years in my role as a consultant radiographer in gyne, gyne oncology. I was very lucky and fortunate to be able to help to influence the sort of the, the the way that PRD is managed and supported Macmillan in um, good information for patients um, and so it, re it really does remain a passion of mine for us to be able to support and raise the awareness of, of what PRD is, the impact and how we can help to manage it. So thank you so much for coming, Willie. Um, do you want to just introduce yourself and say hello? Yes. yes. Um, well, thanks for that, Lisa. I, um, you used the word passion in there, and it's, it's something that's why I'm here. I feel really passionate about what happened to me and, uh, and getting my story out um, with a view to making some improvements because there, there is definite need for improvements. Um, yeah, so introductions. My name's Willie Ald. I'm a 69 year old um, retired civil engineer and I actually became a trustee of the PRDA in 2018 um, and we'll, I'll maybe talk, we'll maybe talk about that a little bit, a bit further on. Um, it was really because I was struggling and uh, we contacted the PRDA and I, I'd never heard of them before. Um, so that's, and that's ultimately how I've, how I've ended up here, to be honest. And it, it's great that you have, because I think for us as healthcare professionals and, and, and those trying to support and awareness to have someone's voice who has that experience on the ground it, it is so valuable um, to share that, that experience. Willie, can you just tell us a little bit about your sort of diagnosis and, and, and how that evolved? Yes, I'll, I'll go back. I'll go back to 2015, actually. Um, I won't dwell too much on the cancer part of this because it's not really why I'm here, but it's obviously very, very relevant. Um, I, would, I was diagnosed with a very aggressive prostate cancer in mid-2015. Um, I was given the choice at that time of radiotherapy or a prostatectomy to remove it. I decided to have the surgery to remove my prostate. Main reason being that um, the medical profession were fairly convinced that it was all contained in there. So, so I had the surgery in October of 2015. Unfortunately, um, it didn't work in as much as I still had the cancer. Uh, my PSA, for those of you who, who know PSA numbers, my PSA had dropped quite dramatically, but it was still there. So I still had the cancer. So the next course of treatment was radiotherapy which I then had the following April, I had 20 sessions right. of radiotherapy. Um, I didn't really have any option, to be honest, because I'd had the prostatectomy, hadn't, hadn't got rid of the cancer as I'd hoped. So I, I had no option but to go with the radiotherapy. Um, unfortunately, and we can talk about this in some detail in a few minutes, that's why I'm sitting here today, is because of the radiotherapy. 
and I think it's it's really tough isn't it because actually you're in a position where you have to go down a route of, of certain treatment and you sort of sign on the dotted line but and, and and you know we can send patients to the risk of late effects um and and i think generally we all know there's an early and a late effect from radiotherapy um the early effects we're obviously less worried about because they tend to be manageable and resolve but the the big issue is those late effects so so did you did you get many early effects whilst you were on treatment and for a short time after well <laughs> I, I, I'm, what i'm about to say may contradict slightly what you just said and, and which is another point here actually i would imagine if you got 100 people with prd the story there'll be 100 different stories um i i think everybody's story will be different i i'll come back to the point about warning prior to radiotherapy because that's quite a big deal for me but i'll come back we'll come back to that later on in our, in our conversation lisa about halfway through after about 10 sessions i started to notice some bladder effects um, and this was described to me as radiation cystitis um, and it really it really was that there was just some pain some discomfort some frequency issues and, and some urgency issues and that that started after about 10 sessions and kind of gradually got worse all the way through my treatment um, then probably quite near the end maybe after 17 or 18 treatments i started noticing problems with my bowel right um, which again have been described to me at the time or as proctitis um again it was it was kind of frequency it was urgency it was some pain and um, but it wasn't it, at that stage it wasn't too bad but and, and i knew i knew what had caused it um and i i made an assumption then that it was going to get better after the treatment stopped um although i got a bit of a shock after my last after my last treatment the radiographer said to me asked how i was doing and i explained some of the what i've just said and she said oh she said that will get a lot worse before it gets better and that was quite shock really as as i left the hospital thinking wow um and i have to say that she was absolutely spot on it it did get a lot worse <laughs> a lot worse and so thinking more of the sort of the longer term was was there a continual increase in the side effects that you noticed or did you ever have a point where things improved after the treatment and then you ran into the the post-treatment effects no wow. there was no improvement at all wow. and she was right both my bladder and my bowel and my bowel in particular actually which was the thing that maybe bothered me more go worse and worse and tall about four or five weeks after my radiotherapy was finished i i, I honestly couldn't see how i could carry on with my body doing what it was doing um i was my i would concentrate on my bowel actually just now my, I, I was having to empty my bowels five maybe six times in 24 hours including during the night which really really freaked me out um serious pain serious pain whenever i went uh you know how you know how medics ask you on a scale of zero to nine you know all this or zero to ten well this was an eight or a nine it was horrendous there was some blood not a lot of blood some blood um but i just I just couldn't see. I didn't know what was going to happen, I, I, and I did that thing, you know, which we all do in a way. I kind of catastrophized a bit at that stage, and I kind of thought, "This is going to be like this forever." I, I because it lasted two, maybe three weeks, like that. I mean, it really was. I had a horrendous period of two to three weeks of just what I've just described, um, and that was difficult, really, really difficult. And so at that point, 
did you ever imagine you would be here at this stage still managing those symptoms? No, no, not at all, not at all. And that, that's the point I made about catastrophizing. I, I just thought that was it. I thought this is, this is the way my life's going to be. Um, even thoughts like I might have been better with the cancer than this, um, it was so bad. Uh, so, as I say, that lasted probably a couple of weeks, maybe maybe three weeks, as intense as that. Um, I then noticed that it started easing a bit. Right. A little bit. Uh, over, over probably a month, maybe four to six weeks, I noticed it easing off a bit. One of the big things actually was the, the intense pain mm -hmm. pretty well went away over that period. Right. So that, that was huge. I mean, that was huge for me because I was, you know, when, when you have to go five or six times in a 24 hour period and you're dreading the pain that you're going to experience, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it just, yeah, it's difficult. So the pain, the pain had probably subsided over, as I say, the next two or three weeks. Um, and I think at then, I then reached the plateau. So we're probably talking here about maybe two months. Right. two and a half months after my treatment finished and it plateaued at that point but it still wasn't great i was still and as i say i will concentrate on my bowel actually because that's been the thing that that has uh, has given me the most bother all the way through and, um, and, and i think what's you know the way you're describing the the physical impact it's had i think it's really important to put that into perspective on the the catastrophic change it must have had on your day-to-day -day living and your quality of life. Absolutely. I, I, absolutely, Lisa. The, although I said it had improved, it had improved slightly, really the pain gone and it had reached this plateau. And I have to say, I'm probably still on the same plateau, to be quite honest. Um, I went another six or seven months like that with no help. And this, this is part of the reason why I'm sitting here just now. I got no help whatsoever. I became quite depressed. My mental health deteriorated. Um, I was put on antidepressants by my GP. I, you talked there about quality of life. I had no quality of life. I was still frightened to leave the house. I, I'm quite, I've always been quite an active person throughout my life and uh, I like getting outdoors and I like doing stuff. I did not leave, and this this is without a word of a lie, I did not leave my house for eight months. I was frightened. I, I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and that was a terrible period. Dur during that period, did, was there any medical intervention? Was there any acknowledgement by the team around you? Yeah, well, that, well, well, no is the answer to that. Um, this is part of the bit that really, really upsets me. I had gone back, I, I obviously had some routine appointments with my oncologist mm -hmm. after the radiotherapy and, and various tests from a PSA and all sorts of stuff. And um, I reported back what I've just told you about what was happening to me. And, and I was met with really a blank expression of, well, I, looking back on it, and I read it this way at the time, but even looking back on it, it was, I, it was as if she didn't know what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And probably carrying on from that, it was as if she didn't know what to do next. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of, basically I was told at that stage, this is very rare, people, people don't come back and say this, what you're saying, and it will get better. I went back with another three months and it was just the same and I reported the same to be met with the same expression. Um, I eventually, about five or six months later, was referred to a gastroenterologist, a GI consultant. And I didn't get very far there either. The only thing he did, one of my symptoms that I haven't mentioned actually was, was hugely excessive gas. 
he sent me for a test for something that I'd never heard of before and now know very well, something called small intestine bacterial overgrowth or SIBO, we'll call it SIBO from here on in. He sent me for a test and lo and behold it was positive, so I had SIBO as well as the other things. Um, but that was all, there was nothing else, there was no, I think, looking back on it, I think one of the big things was I didn't have a lot of bleeding, which, which some people do. I think when there's bleeding, there's some physical intervention that doctors can do. But because I didn't have that, I, I, I think they were a bit stuck. I, I don't think they knew what to do next with me. Um, so, and, and that's really, you know, I said earlier on that I didn't leave the house. I didn't leave the house because I couldn't. I was frightened, but not only that, I wasn't getting any help. And that was another contributory factor to my mental health problems at that, at that stage. Absolutely. And I think, you know, when you start to put together all of the symptoms you're experiencing and, you know, often we hear people becoming really bloated and they can't wear their normal clothes because, you know, that 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 bloatedness, the excessive gas is something that actually is is hugely problematic for people. Yeah. Um, and, and just just going back to the, the point you said about bleeding, I think, you know, bleeding is a trigger for investigation and so I think if you present with bleeding you fall into that that yeah. way of right we need to investigate you we need to see what's going on yeah whereas actually the the sort of the other symptoms that that you're describing tend to carry less weight in triggering a referral to a specialist yeah. um, I think that's what's key with radiotherapy uh, and PRD, it's having someone who understands the implications of the changes to the tissues that, that you would have experienced. Yeah, absolutely. I, my life changed in January 2017. Uh, you'll remember I said I had my radiotherapy in April of 2016. In January 2017, one or two things came together. Uh, one is I found Maggie's, actually, um, and that helped hugely with my mental health um, I saw the psych psychologist at Maggie Stundee and that was that was wonderful but the other thing that happened at more or less the same time was right out of the blue I got a phone call from a colorectal nurse from the hospital who <coughs> had seen some emails about me which had been flying around and she thought wow and she had an interest um, in, in this and um, she was part of a Macmillan project at that time so she phoned me up at home and it was it was a light bulb moment it was it was amazing and not that she was able to give me huge answers and not that she was able to cure me no. but she was able to reassure me that i wasn't alone and that she understood what i was going through and she was the first person i had encountered in the medical profession who gave me any indication that they understood um, and that was that was huge huge for me and also that there are so many people out there in a position where they've had life-changing fallout from their pelvic radiotherapy yeah so from that point on once i still go to maggie's actually so that the maggie's the maggie's one was is is excellent and i've made some good friends um but in terms of my prd I saw that nurse in person maybe three, four times. She told me that the damage that had been done, the fibrosis, if you like, of my of my bladder and my bowel was permanent. It wouldn't repair. And that seems to be the way with um, radiation damage to, uh, to tissue. But she was able to give me some advice about uh, toileting. Mm -hmm. One of the other things I haven't mentioned that, that when the, the extreme pain and everything died down, one of the problems I was having was, some people may call it constipation. I don't know what the definition of constipation is, to be perfectly honest. My system seemed to work okay until it came to going to the toilet. I had great difficulty actually emptying my bowel. Yeah. Real difficulty, straining, just straining beyond belief. And I, I was at the point of thinking, I'm gonna do myself some damage here doing this. Um, she was able to tell me that that's not the case, 
that there was things I could do. She prescribed, she didn't prescribe me, it's actually a, a, an over-the-counter medication that she advised me to try, and I, which I did, and it helped, and I still take it. Um, that, that, that really was it. And I think, I think that's one of the big things with this condition, Lisa, is there is no magic bullet. There is no cure. There's just things that you can try, give this a go, see if this helps. There is nothing will get rid of this. And I, to this day, still have lots of the symptoms that I have spoken about earlier on. Um, one, of the, one of the things I have done, and we might touch on this later on actually, although we're probably running short of time. <laughs> is tenesmus which yeah. is another condition that that and, and it and this was part of the thing that was really messing up my life in a way i would I, I have trained my bowel to go once a day yes. and that's taken me probably three or four years to do that to the, get to the stage that i'm at now i have trained and i'm not quite sure how you advise someone else to do that but I'm, I'm, I'm quite determined, so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, I'd kind of rolled up my sleeves and thought, I'm going to try and beat this. Yeah. The tenesmus part of this and the unpredictable, unpredictability of my bowel movement means that I don't really know what I can do in the rest of that day until I know how my bowel has behaved in the right. morning. Yeah. So it makes it very difficult to plan. Yes. I tend not to plan things where people are relying on me because I'm maybe at the last minute have to say, sorry guys. Um, yeah. Uh, I have to say that for the most part, it works out okay. And uh, and I do pat my head a wee bit for that as well. I, I've kind of worked at this and I've, 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 but it's there and it's there every single day. So one, one of the things that I, I really want to pick up on, and I think it's it really is tantamount to just how focused you have been is, you know, you're off kayaking tomorrow, you know, and so what you've done is you've worked with a specialist, you've worked with PRD and, and, and supporting other people to really take control as much as they can. Yep but to gain some elements of, of, of your quality of life back. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's a really important message. And I, I don't know whether you would echo that. Yeah, I, the control, control word is huge, actually, in all of this. Um, and it goes back to the cancer diagnosis as well. I mean, anybody who gets diagnosed with a, with a, a nasty cancer um, immediately feels they've lost control of everything their whole life. Mm -hmm. But I had also lost control of my bodily functions. <laughs> um, and, and to work at that and get, get that back to a point that's acceptable mm -hmm. has been quite satisfying to me um as i say I, you know i've looked at myself and say well willie you did that you know with, with some help with yeah. some help it's interesting you mentioned the kayaking i took that up about three years ago um it's an activity that suits me particularly with my prd suits me right down to the ground i love the water i used to sail so I just love being on the water, but we stopped sailing some time ago. One of the other things I haven't mentioned that, that my bowel does, I can't spend too long upright. I can go for a walk for maybe 40 minutes, 35, 40 minutes, which I do regularly. Any longer than that, my bowel starts to feel as if, it starts to feel as if it's complaining. It starts to feel as if I might not be able to hold the contents in there. If I'm upright, I can sit in the kayak because I'm sitting down. I can sit there all day and it, it doesn't, it doesn't that happen. part of things doesn't bother me. And it takes other boxes as well because it's I, I'm out in the fresh air. Yeah. I'm seeing some beautiful places. I can watch the wildlife and I can get really, really good exercise at the same time. Yeah. I've been very lucky and I do understand that there will be other sufferers of PRD who, who maybe can't do that and and I really you know I feel for them. I, I've been I consider myself lucky that I've found something that I can fit in. 
yeah and, and and that's fantastic absolutely fantastic and you know if that's just a little bit of a glimmer of hope to people who are way behind where you're at i think that's that's a really important message um, um I, I appreciate we're we're running out of, of our time slot but what probably uh the biggest feedback or, or, or um thought of today was when you said the prd had been bigger than your cancer and i think for for that all of the healthcare professionals that are joining us today that's a message to really hold on to because actually we can't always make it totally better but acknowledging that the impact that has is massive on, yeah. on the people that we're we're working with yeah just to summarize on that point lisa my cancer is now incurable because the radiotherapy didn't work, which is another <laughs> uh, irony, if you like. My cancer is now incurable. Um, it's controlled by hormone treatment for as long as the hormone treatment works. But on a day-to-day -day basis, the PRD is still a bigger issue to me than the cancer. Even although I'm living with a, a terminal illness, uh, which I have no time scale for at all, on a day to day basis, the PRD bothers me more than the cancer. And I, I think that's uh, the most powerful message that we can we can share today with with everyone joining us. So all I can say really is thank you so much for sharing sharing that and I hope it just goes some way to just really raising the profile and awareness of of what people are, are experiencing so thank you you're very welcome and I'm, I'm very happy to to explain all of this if it can help other people including the medical profession thank you